Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Hello and welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar coming to you live from Chagas, the Chagas studio in Carlo. My name is Mark Gibson and over the next hour we'll be discussing how farmers can reduce their greenhouse gas emissions from chemical nitrogen. But bef before we go any further, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to introduce my studio panel, uh, Dr. Deirdre Hennessy, Senior Research Officer in Chagask Moor Park, specialising in grassland and clover incorporation. And we're also joined by Dr. Seamus uh, Carney, who is a training and development specialist with Chagask, the Chagas Signpost Programme. Deirdre and Seamus, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank That's you very great. much, Mark. So to get us uh, started, uh, Seamus is going to take <coughs> some pr practical steps farmers can take to reduce their nitrogen use and at the same time reduce their emissions. Please send us your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and we'll put these to our panel throughout the show. Today's show is being recorded and will be available on the Chagas website in the coming days. We'll now hand over to Seamus for his presentation. Good morning and welcome. Uh, this morning I want to look at uh, where Irish agricultural emissions come from, uh, why nitrous oxide emissions are so important in the con context of Irish agriculture, and more importantly, thirdly, how can we as an industry reduce our nitrous oxide emissions? So we're going to start first of all by looking at the Irish agricultural emissions and where they come from. And you can see from the pie chart there, uh, the blue part of the chart, about 57.5% of our emissions come from intermic fermentation. Uh, about 10% from how we store and how we spread our manure. Uh, so some of that is nitrous oxide, some of it is methane. The green part is how we use our fertilizers and when we use them, and also some emissions from soils. So that's our nitrous oxide part. And there's about another 5% that are made up between lime uh, and fuel usage and uh, urea uh, application as well. Um, so really when we look at it overall in the context, uh, we're looking at about 65 or two-thirds of our emissions are coming from methane, but the reason we're looking at nitrous oxide this morning is 30% of our overall emissions are coming from nitrous oxide. Um, and I suppose the other thing to bear in mind with nitrous oxide, uh, it is a very, uh, it's the most potent of all the agricultural uh, greenhouse gases, uh, 268 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So 30% of our emissions coming from nitrous oxide. And that's why we need to try and reduce our nitrous oxide emissions to hence reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from Irish agriculture. And how do we go about reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and our nitrous oxide emissions? I suppose first of all this morning I want to look at five different pathways. So number one, we need to look at liming. Number two, we need to look at improving our P and K, hence that we can reduce the amount of nitrogen, chemical nitrogen we're using. We need to retain more of the nitrogen in our slurries. We need to grow our own nitrogen in clover. And whatever nitrogen we use after that, we need to change to a more environmentally uh, form of fertiliser in the form of protected urea. So first of all, we need to, to, to look at liming here. And if we look at liming, some work from our, our colleagues in, in Johnstown Castle, uh, where they took an example of uh, soil at 5.5 pH. And by spreading 5 tonne of lime per hectare on that soil, they managed to lift the P levels on that soil by over 5 parts per million, two indexes in total. But as well as that, by getting naturally occurring phosphorus out of the ground, there was also the added benefit that that soil also released naturally occurring nitrogen up to 80 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. So the big message here is by getting the lime of the pH right first of all, we're releasing more naturally occurring phosphorus and more importantly nitrogen from the ground, hence we can cut back on our chemical nitrogen applications. Secondly, by building P and K levels, it helps to get more use of the nitrogen we sprayed on our farms. So if we look at it here, first of all, look at the graph, uh, I suppose the first point is, if we have very low P, uh, H, P and K, uh, we're getting very low utilisation out of our nitrogen. If we move to the next point, by getting the lime right, we're getting better utilisation. By improving the lime and the P levels, we're, we're improving our utilisation better. By improving the P and K, we're improving it further again. And really the optimum is getting the lime P and K. So that's lime over 6.2 for grassland, 6.5 for clover, uh, and into index trees and fours for P and K, uh, especially index three for productive farms. And by doing that, we're improving the amount of nitrogen that we can retain from the nitrogen we spread, and hence reduce the overall amount of chemical nitrogen we need to spread on our farms. Thirdly, we need to retain more of the nitrogen from our slurry, again to cut back on the amount of chemical nitrogen we're using at farm level. So if we look at it here, first of all, we have a splash plate, uh, and this is kind of common over a decade ago on all farms, all slurry was spread by splash plate. And by going spreading a splash plate in the summer, we're only retaining about three units of nitrogen per thousand gallons, because we're losing a lot of it to volatilization and to the sun actually uh, reducing the amount of utilization we're getting from our slurries. 
So by moving the splash plate to the springtime, we're doubling the amount of nitrogen we're retaining in our slurry. But really, the ultimate and, and the gold standard is to move our slurries from a splash plate in the summer to moving it in the spring and ultimately trying to get our slurries spread by low emission slurry spreading. And by doing that, we're re tripling the recovery of the nitrogen in that slurry. So by tripling the nitrogen we recover in the slurry, we're able to cut down on our chemical nitrogen that we use. Fourthly, we need to grow our own nitrogen, and by doing this, by getting our clover right on farms, so by getting the lime P and K right, we can incorporate clover into our farms. And this is just some work showing uh, the amount of clover and swords. Uh, this was work done by our colleagues in Chagas Moor Park, where they were spreading 150 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. And you can see starting off at the start of the year that the clover levels are low. Once we hit April and the weather starts warming up, the clover starts to take off and replace chemical nitrogen on these farms. And by getting the clover right on farms, we can replace up to 100 to 120 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year, again cutting down on the amount of chemical nitrogen we're using. But it's important that the, the, the clover ground is grazed tight in its first year to leave sun down to the, to, the, to, to, the, to the base of the plant, and also that we need to get more than 20% clover to really get the nitrogen benefits from these clover swords. The fifth way we can try and reduce the nitrous oxide emissions is by moving our fertilizer to more environmentally friendly fertilizers. And if we look at it here from the graph, CAN is the most, um, the most nitrous oxide of all our fertilizers. And if we compare it versus urea or protected urea, which are 70% lower in the amount of nitrous oxide emissions that they give off compared to CAN. So I suppose really we need to move away from urea as well because there's ammonia in urea. We have a national ceiling for ammonia which we've been in breach of for the last while. So really the big message here is we need to replace urea with protected urea to reduce ammonia and we need to replace our can with protected urea to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And if we look at pr pr uh, can and protected urea, uh, every 5 uh, tonne of can is the same as 3 tonne of protected urea. So the same amount of nitrogen, physical nitrogen in each of the scenarios, but by moving from can to protected urea, uh, so from 5 tonne of can to 3 tonne of protected urea, at current prices we can save farmers a thousand euro for every 5 tonne of can and move to 3 tonne of protected urea, and by moving every 5 tonne of can to 3 tonne of protected urea, uh, we can save the equivalent of emissions of almost a dairy cow, 0.9 of a dairy cow, or one and a half suckler cows. So really our summary from this morning, what we're trying to say is we need to reduce our chemical nitrogen first of all by getting our soil pH right, by getting our P and K levels right, by recovering more nitrogen in our slurry, by spreading it in the spring with low emissions, by growing our own nitrogen through clover. And any further nitrogen we use after that, we need to start moving from can to protected urea type products. And really when we look at it here, uh, reducing our chemical nitrogen by 25% uh, can give a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions on intensively stocked farms by in the region of 4 or 5% in greenhouse gas emissions. Where if we move from 100% can to 100% protected urea, we can deliver reductions of between 7 and 8% in greenhouse gas emission reduction at farm level. So thank you very much for your attention and we'll now take any questions in the Q&A. Now, thanks, Seamus, for that presentation. Really compelling case for that shift from uh, urea to protected urea. Just a reminder to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask us any questions. And uh, this session is being recorded. So, Seamus, thanks for joining us back here uh, on the panel. Thank you very um, much, Mark. And, um, Seamus, just to start out, I mean, what, in your view, are, is, is the greatest, has the greatest effect in reducing greenhouse gases emissions on farms? Is it changing from can to protected urea or reducing fertilizer use uh, from f by 20% on farms? Yeah, excellent question, Mark. And look, I suppose the, the big one is supposed to reduce our emissions. We haven't any big silver bullet, but I suppose protected urea is the closest thing we have, as I'd say, to a bronze bullet, the biggest technology we have to reduce emissions. So, really, Mark, I suppose the big, the big shift you want to make, first of all, is to move from can to protected urea and also from urea to protected urea to reduce your ammonia. But by moving from can to protected urea, you're really bringing your, your nitrous oxide emissions down by, uh, by but down to about a quarter of what they would be. So that is definitely a starting point. After that, then, Mark, we work on trying to reduce the overall amount of nitrogen we use at, at farm level. And you mentioned in your presentation, uh, you know, lime, phosphorus, potash and, and clover as, as ways of reducing the chemical nitrogen. Could, could you place these in I items in, in order of importance? Yeah, uh, so the, the first building block mark is lime. Okay? And if we look at grassland soils in Ireland, about 50% of them are the productive soils in Ireland now are low in lime. So that's the first thing, first of all, to release nit the nitrogen and the phosphorus as we're talking. Then the second part after that is to get the P and the K levels right. Uh, by getting those right, we get better use of our nitrogen and we can cut down our chemical nitrogen use. And really then when all those are in place, you can start putting in your clover in at that stage. Because clover needs over 6.5 pH, 
uh, it needs index 3 for P, index 3 for K. So then the clover comes in as the, the third part of that step, mm -hmm. and that's when you start fixing nitrogen, uh, or really start growing your own nitrogen to reduce your overall chemical nitrogen. Deirdre, if I could turn to you, uh, you know, the government has set uh, fairly ambitious tar targets to reduce the amount of chemical nitrogen being used by farmers. What can farmers do now to, to prefer, prepare for this low nitrogen future? Yeah, so, you know, they can start to put in place the, the, the things that James has mentioned. Again, reiterating uh, lime, um, P and K, getting that right, but then start working on getting that clover in and using good grassland management, measuring grass that's on their farm, using information like predicted grass growth, putting all that suite of information together, then they can make real decisions around reducing chemical fertilizer. So if you know what you're growing, you know what you need to feed your cows, then you can make the decision if there's an opportunity to reduce chemical fertilizer use. So Clover will automatically give you uh, um, a really good opportunity through fixation. But if, we, if you're managing your grass and you know your demand, your feed supply and so on, even in a grass-only system or part of the farm, you can make that decision about reducing chemical fertilizer use. And there's big opportunities in the summer. So, you know, if you think about it, Mark, every little helps. So every little bit that's caught at every rotation, you know, that all sums up at the end of the year. And is clover a solution for every farm uh, soil type? Probably not, realistically, uh, Mark. So uh, as Seamus said, you know, it likes a uh, good soil pH over 6.5. Some of our soils, you know, the, you won't get to that, particularly our more peaty soils. Clover doesn't like its feet being wet, if you want to put it that way. It doesn't like sitting in very wet soils. So it will struggle in some of those soils. But, you know, there, there's, there's most of our soil types will have we'll be able to have some level of clover. And look, we can break our farms down. You know, soil type in most farms is not identical in every single paddock. So there are probably areas of the farm that it can be incorporated in. And I suppose that's really the farmer, him or herself, knows what part of their farm that they can put clover in uh, or the part of their farm that it's more likely to, to work well in. So, you know, there's lots of information out there, but also the farmer needs their own information around their soil type, their fertility status, the type of sward they have on their farms, and indeed their, their demand for nitrogen on their farms, because obviously lower stocking rates, you have less demand for grass. Um, so, you know, maybe there's less of a role in, in some of those scenarios. Having said that, on very low stocking rates, stocking rate farms where you don't need a lot of nitrogen going out adding clover into the soil just managing the grass a little bit increases the feed quality so for example it can increase your growth rate or your life weight gain mm -hmm. for example so there's big roles for clover going forward Seamus dear to mention soil fertility what can farmers be doing now to to start preparing for having having good soil fertility to for, for, for clover and indeed having uh, even some of the, the multi-species wards in place. Yeah, I suppose the, fir the first point, Mark, is soil samples. Uh, take soil samples, number one, and have the soil samples. Number two, take the soil samples out of the drawer, make them live, uh, even mark the paddocks that are, are, are good or bad for, for is lime P or K, so at least you know uh, what you need to build up on those, those paddocks in at that stage. So soil samples, first of all, getting the P and K right, having a fertilizer plan, a nutrient management plan, so you know where you need to target the nutrients. And you'll see that in a minute with Edwin, uh, like his farm is uh, way ahead of the national average with lime P and K. Uh, and, and that's one of the big foundations that Edwin has in his farm in order to reduce his chemical nitrogen, but also to improve the clover that he's growing on the farm then as well at the same time. Just finally in relation to slurry, uh, there is great nitrogen value in slurry, we know that. Uh, so which is more important? Is it spreading slurry in the springtime or using the, the low emission slurry spreading techniques? Yeah, well, I suppose, uh, we, we've gone from zero to about 36% of our slurry now spread in low emission at this stage. So not everyone is spreading with low emission. So the, the, for, the first step is to get the slurry out early in the year. So ideally, March, April, uh, just before the 1st of May. Uh, that way you're retaining more nitrogen. Then if you can make the next step and putting out with low emission, you're going that really the gold standard of spreading slurry at that stage. Uh, and like basically 2,500 gallons of slurry in the spring with a low emission is replacing about 25 units of nitrogen. Uh, that's really your application for the first round. Uh, so definitely moving to the spring first of all, then getting it out with low emissions where at all possible. 
Okay, great. Well, we're going to come back to those questions and more, and do keep your questions coming in to us. Uh, we see lots coming through. Uh, but next, we're going to go live uh, to the farm of Edwin Thompson in Golden County, Tipperary. But before we do that, we had the opportunity to catch up with Edwin a few weeks ago. My name is Edwin Thompson. I'm farming here in Golden County, Tipperary. I'm currently milking 158 cows on a milking platform of 140 acres. We also rear the heifers here on the farm. It's a family-run farm, um, so I'm farming here with my parents and we've one labour unit employed full-time as well. I'm married to my wife, Diane, with three kids who are also interested in farming and they give a hand when they can. We were always interested in the environment on this farm. As you can see in the background, there's lots of trees, lots of hedges. When this opportunity came up to join the Signpost programme, I felt it was a good fit for me and a good fit for this farm. I'm keen on the clover and I like the sustainability aspect where, where farming can survive on its own without depending on too much use of chemicals. The first thing we did was we made a conscious effort to purchase protected urea. With the use of the protected urea, I. I don't see any obvious reduction in grass growth. So I'm very happy that the, the, the parts of the farm that require the nitrogen, it's working very well. Also, we've invested in a slurry spreading system called, uh, with a dribble bar, which is L-E-S-S, -S, which is the less slurry spreading, which is um, very beneficial to the, to the farming system here and to the dairy farming, because we can spread our slurry and we can graze it again quite quickly. We've currently reseeded 35 acres of, of, of the grazing platform here. We, on these clover paddocks, these got no nitrogen since the middle of May. But at the same time, we are watching the peas and the k's, so it got a, a half a bag of 0730 during the summer. It also gets dairy washings, and the lime is correct. The benefits are massive. Um, not only do I have cash in my pocket, but these paddocks, we don't have to spread them every, every time the cows graze them. So I'm saving on labor, I'm helping the environment and I'm growing the grass. Now we now join Shane O'Hanlon, Chagas Signpost Advisor, and Edwin Thompson, who's a dairy farmer in Golden County, Tipperary. Good morning, Shane and Edwin. How are you today? Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Mark. Yes, Mark. So I'm joined here with Edwin Thompson. Um, a dairy signpost farmer um, in Golden County Tipperary and behind this you can see Edwin's cows are actually grazing a receded paddock with grass and clover that was receded this year. Um, so I suppose just to start off Edwin, in your experience um, what are two easy wins that farmers can adapt to to reduce emissions on their farm? Um, well Shane the first uh, and obvious one is the the protected urea. We made a conscious effort um, on this farm the last couple of years to spread only protected urea and it's working very well like I said on the video before so protected urea saving save me a little bit of money and it's saving um, the the environment as well um, it, with the protected urea then we, we changed um, to 18 6 12s which gives us um, a bit more control of the P's and K's that we spread throughout the year and it's also the 18 6 12 fertilizer is also quite beneficial to the um, environment um, in, con in comparison to um, the old pasture sward or the cut sward, so that's the, that's the first thing we did, Shane. And I suppose in relation to protected jury, Edwin, you made the conscious decision just to try it yourself. Um, so you obviously tried with a small amount, gained the confidence to progress that, and obviously you bought more and have been getting on very well with it since. Yeah, I think in 2020 I, I bought a, a couple of tons of it and tried it, and I. I saw it worked very well. In 2021, we I think it was nearly all protected urea. I can't quite remember now, but um, it worked very well again. And again, this year, 2022, it's been all protected urea. Um, but that that goes with the P's and, with the 18612. You know, so the protected urea is just the nitrogen end of it. Um, the P's and K's. Then we look at we we're using the um, the 18612. And is there any other um, practice? Well, the the. the the dribble bar, of course, on the on the on the vacuum tanker has. Um, I see huge benefits to, to to the amount of grass grown compared to the old splash plate, where we're plastering the grass in slurry. <clears throat> the dribble bar just puts the slurry out in a nice little line, <clears throat> and um, excuse me, in a nice line, and it's much um, 
much nicer for the cows then to come along and a couple weeks later they can graze it. There's no tainting of the grass and the, the grass has access to light and, and, and can grow much more effectively. So the dribble bar is a big, is a big help as well. And we just saw in your introductory video there, Edwin, that you have a, a lot of clover on this farm and I suppose that has allowed you to reduce your lichen substantially, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, two years ago I, I reseeded 18 acres and I did another 18 acres this year. So there's about 35 acres reseeded now to date. Um, and in the, those reseeds, we, we, we targeted the, the timing of the reseed was in the springtime to allow the clover to grow. Um, so we put, we, um, we made sure that we had clover in the, in the reseed. And, um, so those paddocks get no nitrogen, um, no chemical nitrogen spread on them f from, um, <clears throat> from May, <clears throat> from May onwards. So, <clears throat> but it's important to say that you maintain a constant P and K level. Yes, those paddocks. Yeah, absolutely. They, they regularly get, um, dairy washings. They also got a top up of um, um, 0730 during the summer. Um, they got slurry in the springtime, and in fact, one of them um, got a little bit of extra lime this year because it, it had it had the, the soil was all showed it was a little bit low, so I gave it another bit of lime this year again, even after the reseed last year. So it's um, these paddocks are well looked after. Um, the, the peas are good, the k's are good, the lime is correct, um, and the clover is supplying the nitrogen. <clears throat> so I suppose just to put that into context, Mark. Um, from Edwin switching from traditional fertilizers such as can um, caught in pasture sward to protected urea, that has saved his total fertilizer bill at current prices by six six thousand euro, and to put that into context, is worth forty euro cow to him, as well as decreasing his overall emissions on the farm by four percent. And I suppose on top of that, Edwin mentioned he reduced nitrogen substantially due to clover on the farm, so he has reduced his nitrogen by thirty eight percent which again equates to about 7,000 euro in a saving. To put that back into context in cow terms, that's worth 50 euro a cow. So those two actions, as well as an extra um, percent to decrease his overall emissions on his farm. So it has a massive saving financially, as well as decreasing his emissions over a quick, quick, over a year really, you could say, Edwin, isn't it? It's a year, a year and a half, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> And Ed, Edwin, if I could ask you, just you know, you're you're well on the journey to implementing these various sustainability measures on your farm. I mean, is, is this adding a lot to your workload, or is this integrating with your existing system? No, Mark, it it integrates very um, easily with with the existing system. There's no there's no massive investment to buying um, protected urea. All you do is ring up the co-op and, and and order it. It it spreads the same as your traditional fertilizer. So, in that sense, it's 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 no problem. Um, and then there's a little bit less spreading involved. You know, we're, with the clover, we don't need to spread as often. So I, I'm sort of noticing now this year particularly that um, we used to always go out once a week with the fertilizer spreader and top up the paddocks that had been grazed in the previous few days, but probably only go out now maybe twice every three weeks, you know, with the fertilizer spreader just to... Those clover paddocks don't need topping up as regularly. So it's, it's, um, it's very beneficial. So you're, you're cutting down on your diesel at the same time, which is always good news. Yeah. Um, the um, tell me, Edwin, how important is lime in the system you're operating there? Well, I've spread a lot of lime over the years, and it's it's really coming to fruit to um, fruition now. And and as the lads have uh, have explained, that the lime has to be correct for the clover to survive. Um, I suppose that hi historically here we were in the old rep system. We had to spread a lot of lime, and then I continued spreading that. Um, I do regular soil analysis so every every three years, and anything that needs lime gets it, gets two ton of lime, and um, I'd be doing a bit more again now this autumn. <clears throat> and I suppose just on that, Mark, coupled with the lime, um, Edwin, there's a major focus on soil fertility on the farm, Edwin. So I suppose you're using low emission, you're getting good value from your slurry. You got your slurry analyzed this spring, which is a great way to determine what you have exactly in your tank, and you can, I suppose, have a plan tailored based on what you have. So that's what you do, Edwin, and that's what yeah, you Yeah, we, we've, we've got the slurry analysed, like you said, Shane, and that gave us great information on where to put the best, our, our strongest slurry, where to put it, and um, the more dilute slurry was suitable then on the grazing paddocks um, and that kind of thing. Also, we, we sat down at the start of the year, too, we, we came up with a plan for, for the fertiliser, which was a great... Shane came along and, and my, my, my um, tip crop advisor, Andrew Neil came along, we sat down in the kitchen, we came up with a plan, and we... We, we purchased as much um, phosphate as we could that my allowance allowed. So we, 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 we forward bought 
eighteen six twelve, and um, to maximise our, our, our phosphate allowance. And that was used then during the year. And it, once we had a plan in place, it was very easy to implement it. Very good. Uh, Shane, can, if I can ask you, I mean, you're, you're working with a number of different signpost uh, farmers in, in the region. What, what has been the general response to the programme and, and the, uh, the measures that are being rolled out on farms across the, the region? Yeah, that's correct, Mark. So um, currently I'm working with three um, signpost farmers in the Tip Tipperary region. Um, so I suppose, it's, as Edwin said, it's getting the basics right. And it's coming, it's, I suppose at the start of the year, it's drawing up a plan and trying to follow that plan as best you can. Um, so again, I suppose it's the easy wins, as Seamus said, it's in, it, adopting protected urea. It's, it's not a big um, investment in relation to labor or in, infrastructure. It's just a case of going to your co-op and putting in that order and starting from there. And I suppose as Edwin has explained, he started, I suppose, with a small bit and has progressed and has seen nothing but advantages from it. So I suppose that's what we're, on the signpost program trying to encourage and supporting farmers and trying to adopt those new um, practices. Excellent and uh, maybe if we could ask uh, Edwin, I mean since you joined the program the, the measures you've implemented are you seeing uh, immediate effects uh, be it on the, the, the sword or, or your pocket? Yeah the, the the, the, for me, Mark, the, the big thing was to get the clover up going. So we did a lot of reseeding, like we've said. And um, once you get your reseed established and graze it regularly, and, 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 and um, there's no more nitrogen spread on that particular paddock for the rest of the year. So, you know, and, and, and that's a big saving. You know, there's 18 acres last year, 18 acres again this year. So we have 30 odd acres there um, with no chemical nitrogen since May. So, it, you know, it's very beneficial. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, uh, um, Edwin and uh, Shane. We're going to just broaden the discussion here to include our, our panel here in, in studio as well. And uh, we have some questions coming in as well for, for you, uh, uh, Edwin and, and Shane. But uh, Deirdre, if I could turn to you, there's a question coming in in relation to the, uh, the bloat issue that can sometimes be associated with clover establishment. Are, are there any concerns that we should have around that? Yeah, Mark, so like bloat is a, is a concern in, cl in clover systems. I suppose it's probably a bigger concern, you know, in the, in the scenario that Edwin is in where he, he's, you know, uh, converting the farm, we'll call it, to a clover system. So, you know, he's moving between clover and no clover paddocks and I suppose a bit more of an increased risk there. So I suppose first thing you think about bloat is what, what is bloat? bloat? So it's a build up of froth basically in the rumen. Uh, and a build up that traps the gases that the cow is normally belching out um, and that causes the bloat. Mm. But, you know, there's lots of things we can do that are relatively straightforward uh, in terms of minimising the, the, uh, the risk of bloat. So, you know, uh, things like watching post grazing sward heights. That means, you know, your cows aren't being underfed. They're not going to be hungry going into a clover paddock. They're not going to gorge on the clover. So clover, cows do show a preference when they go into the paddock to, to graze the clover first. It's very low dry matter. There isn't a lot of fibre in it. Um, and that's what results in that, in that froth building up in the rumen. Keep some fibre into the cow, so it could be a bit of concentrate. Um, if, if you're in kind of a perfect storm situation where you have like wet or wetter or low dry matter material that the cows are eating. So at the moment, dry matters are fairly low in, in pastures. We've had a good bit of rain, um, but swards are quite lush uh, still. So dry matter is relatively low. Uh, so the things you need to do in that kind of scenario is make sure the cows are not underfed or not hungry going into the paddock. So don't be grazing too tight, as in don't be going below four centimetres. If you are, that means the cows haven't enough in their room and basically going into the new break. Uh, you can give them a smaller break for a couple hours, put up a strip wire and after two or three hours move that. But by doing that, you're forcing them to eat the grass as well as the clover. So they're getting some fibre into the room. And this time of the year, it's probably a bit of concentrate going in as well. Make sure that's available. Um, and then, you know, once, once they have some fibre in the rumen, uh, you can take down that strip wire and they can work away grazing on the paddock for the rest of the day and they'll be fine. You can use bloat oil as well if, 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 if there's a fear 
or a risk of, uh, of bloat, put some bloat oil in the water uh, the day before and while they're in the paddock. This is a little bit in the rumen because having oil in the rumen mm -hmm. helps to um, break, down that, mm -hmm. break down that foam. And for a farmer, it, it sounds it, you need to be informed before you make that decision to in, yeah. in, increase the amount of clover in your swords. How, how should farmers go about uh, you know, educating themselves on that? Yeah, so we actually have some guidelines on the Chagas website, um, just a few steps around bloat management. Um, we have a little booklet that we published earlier in the year and there's a, there's a, there's a section on that again, bloat management. But talk to your advisor, talk to um, you know, other farmers who have good experience with mm -hmm. clover. And I suppose it's just a little bit about being aware. Um, yes, clover, uh, bloat is a potential risk, but you know, in, in a well-managed system, it's not a significant a significant risk. You know, if a farmer's watching his post grazing sward heights, he's making sure his cows are well fed and that there's some fibre in the diet, um, it's easy to manage. So this time of year, Deirdre, when, when farmers run to stretch grass, they'd be probably putting in a bit of silage. Yeah. There's, there's, there's probably maybe three or four kilos of meal going in. Yeah. That would be help. What big, big help, is put, up, put up two fences, one what they're going to eat for that 12 hour period, but give them a smaller break for the first couple of hours just to make them eat the grass with the clover to try and dilute the amount of clover they can take in yeah, at any one time. Yeah, yeah if you're uh, worried, but if, the, if they're eating silage and a bit of concentrate, there's, there's going to be fibre yeah. in the room. And would you leave the cows go out at their, their own pace in the parlour or leave them out to herd together? Uh, would that matter? Uh, I would say, Seamus, uh, yeah, it's better to leave them out together because, you know, if you're leaving them out line by or row by row, you know, the, the cows that hit the paddock first, they're going to have the choice of what's there and they're going to have more opportunity to, to select the clover. Okay, so, so they're, leave they're them out all at the one time. Yeah. There's a question, Edwin, in from our audience there uh, in relation to uh, sl spread, spreading of slurry and what, what in your context or there in Tipperary it does early spreading of slurry uh, what time timing of the, the year would you be getting out with your slurry um, well I think I'm allowed to spread it from the, about the 15th of January but I try to hold it as long as I can um, in 2022 the, this past spring gone it was about the middle of February the 15th of February I think around about then I got in um, my local contractor and we had a few paddocks grazed and um, he came in with the umbilical system and we spread a few paddocks that had been grazed and he spread a few paddocks that had low covers on them. And then I got him back again about a month after that. Um, in about the middle of Patrick's Day, I can't quite remember, but we spread some again with the umbilical. And he, he, he put out about 100,000 gallons each time, which which um, was a great labour saving tool for me. But it, 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 it is, um, and he was using the um, dribble bar on his, his, his umbilical, so it, it, it worked very well. So, Edwin, would it be fair to say you kind of look at it as a resource that you want to manage and get the best value you can get out of it? That you have enough slurry storage? Oh, definitely, Seamus. Um, and the cost of fertiliser now, uh, slurry is a very, very valuable resource on the farm. And um, we, we target, we look at our soil analysis and we target um, paddocks that need it the most. And, and we, we try and put the most suitable slurry on those paddocks, if possible, you know. Okay, and silage ground as well, obviously my silage ground is down the road so it was more difficult to get it out there on the springtime but we put slurry on the silage ground after the second cut this year so um to try just boost the um the p and k levels on that land which is which is probably my lowest um p and k like like all silage ground is my lowest p and k levels but it got two and a half thousand gallons of slurry there in august early august after the second cut silage was taken and getting p and k fertilizers then as well it gets it got um yes it got it got um Four and a half bags of eighteen six twelve in the first cut, which supplied about eighty units of nitrogen, and then whatever for the P and K, and um, I think it got about three and a half bags for the second cut. Very good. Eight, okay. Eighteen six twelve. Yeah. <coughs> we have a question in uh, from our audience. Um, I think Deirdre is probably one for you. Just it's in relation to red clover uh, and more red clover than white clover in the diet. Will that increase the fibre in the diet overall? Yeah, so red clover is a, a bit more fibrous, just simply by the way it grows and its growth structure, it has more of a stem than uh, white clover. But the problem with red clover uh, from a grazing point of view is it's not very persistent. Mm -hmm. The growing point is higher in the sward and it's more likely to be grazed by the plants, so it won't persist, for, it won't persist as long as white clover in the sward. But well, yes, it has a. It would have a higher fibre content. So more silage orientated, dear. Absolutely, Seamus. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. It, and you know, 
look, we just need to look at our organic uh, um, colleagues, our organic farmers, you know, they use that as their main protein source in for their winter feed. So mm -hmm. it is very good feed. Getting up to uh, three crops of silage off it during yeah. the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I wonder, is, is there any experience, Shane, is there any experience of uh, red clover being sown in, in your, your region? There is, Mark, um, but I suppose a lot of farmers are like Edwin, they're trying to uh, get get their soil fertility right and trying to manage, we'll say, white clover in the swards, but definitely red clover has become more popular. And I know Edwin, just from talking to him, he's maybe going to try it next year in an out block, as Deirdre said, a kind of a silage block, just to see how, how that goes. Um, so yeah, I know there has been good uptake, you know, in fairness. Yeah, just maybe a question to Edwin there. Edwin, lime, do you have a specific time of year or is it all year round or when do you spread lime? Um, no, whenever it suits Seamus, um, it, it can be difficult to get an opportunity. So um, I did a bit in the springtime. It just happened to get a, a pad of grazed and it suited. So I got a bit done in the springtime and I have a bit in mind now to do this autumn, but it, um, hopefully it won't get to it. It needs to be done in the next couple of weeks. Um, no, so timing, the time of the year wouldn't matter, Seamus. If, if, if it suits, I'll try and do it. Yeah. Okay, so you you know specific time. I suppose the one thing there, Mark, like credit the farmers, like we hit a forty year high in lime last year, one point three five million yeah. tons. So and it looks like we could even probably go higher again this year. Mm -hmm. The government are bringing in a subsidy there's or sorry, in the budget there's eight or nine million there for lime as well. Mm -hmm. So really it's 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 the starting yeah. block for the any foundation. Out there. For, for any farm. Uh, very much so. Yeah. Absolutely. So that yeah, that soil fertility uh, is, is so important as your your foundation for completely for, for getting good crop. Um, <laughs> with some questions in relation to uh, multi species sword steardra. Uh, but one in particular around, are there any species that could be incorporated or accompanying the clover to reduce the risk of, of, um, of, of bloat uh, in cows? Is that something that has been looked at or are you aware of? We haven't really done any work on that, uh, Mark, but we, you know, uh, in multi-species wards, because you have a mix, you'll have more. You'll have. We'll have more fibre in the in the sward, so it's likely that your your risk of bloat is going to be reduced. So something like plantain or chicory, mm. which which have, they're they're very uh, digestible. Um, they're likely to help reduce. And of course, if you have those in the sward, you know you probably have slightly less clover because plant space competition and so on. Now yeah. the issue with some of the herbs is persistence. persistence yeah. Um, fra from our experiences, plantain looks like it's relatively persistent. We only have a few years work done on that yet. Um, chicory, less so. Um, probably the trampling and so on from, from the cows um, make it less persistent. Gleam seems to do okay under cutting type scenarios, which would be, you know, a lot of the knowledge on multi-species swords is coming, say, from Europe and so on, but a lot of that's the work has been done under cutting rather than grazing, you know, so Chagas yeah. are doing a lot of work now with grazing herbs. Yeah. Uh, but there are other benefits to having herbs in the, in the, in the sward, um, or, or for having multi-species swards mm -hmm. around perhaps growth during drought periods. Mm -hmm. um, there's some evidence from New Zealand that um, plantain may help with reducing nitrate leaching and capturing nitrogen over the winter um, because it's more active in terms of growth over the winter. Uh, so look, there's lots of interesting and potentially beneficial um, benefits of multi-species, but I suppose we need to know a little bit more about how they persist in particular in our grazing systems. Just a question for you, Seamus, they're coming in around compound uh, fertilizers. Um, it's great to see the re such reductions in, in application. Uh, if emissions reductions need to increase more over the next 10 years, will it be necessary and possible to stop chemical nitrogen application altogether? I mean, is that something that we foresee? Um, yeah, look, I, I suppose Deirdre mentioned uh, some of our, our colleagues in organics that they do get away without uh, chemical nitrogen, but I suppose it's all about uh, matching the, what you can grow on your farm mm -hmm. to, to find the demand that you have then as well, Mark, so back to stocking rate. Uh, and I suppose that's the other thing technology as well, like farmers. I suppose we have a target of cutting back 20% mark by 2030. Mm. Uh, and it looks like up to the end of June this year, the first three quarters of the fertilizer year, which starts in October, uh, the nitrogen use or nitrogen sold in Ireland was back 19%. Right. Now, so we're, we're pretty much where we need to be, but the worrying thing is we're back 30% in P and K. Mm -hmm. And like for some farmers that are low in soil fertility, maybe a bag of us of 18, 6, 12, 
might give them the same amount of grass grown as a bag of cut or mm. pastures ward because mm. they're getting out more P and K uh, automatically by going with the, with the bag. And so that's the thing what Adrian is doing with the 18612. He's concentrating the, the, the P and K into a, a shorter amount of spreading periods and he's opening up more opportunity. That's the other big one as well to go straight nitrogen in the form of protected urea. Mm -hmm. So he's going the lower emitting 18612 as a compound, mm -hmm. as he said, lower than, than cut and pastures ward, and he's going for the lower emitting the protected urea then as well mm -hmm. uh, versus can. And like what he's doing there is saving them 90 euro a cow. Like for the average farmer, that's nine or 10,000 euro in a year mm -hmm. for very little extra kind of work we're talking about. Excellent, okay. So no doubt price has had a, a huge impact on that uh, usage over the last number of years as well. Um, just, just finally, Shane, if I could ask a question coming through there uh, about uh, uh, the farm there. Could, could uh, K soil levels be an issue on Edwin's farm going forward while he relies on 18612? <laughs> it's low in K for silage uh, with only a small amount of slurry going out. Would 0730 be a better option? Well, uh, I suppose, Edwin, you're, you're kind of focusing your your P and K application early in the year. And on silage ground, you're, you're obviously taking your first cut off that, so you have offtake off the ground. In relation to the grazing ground, you're grazing continuously and you're not over applying too much P and K, like you're soil sampling regularly as well. So that would be a good way of monitoring it. Um, I, I don't think it's an issue on this farm, Edwin. We'll, we'll, we'll probably do another soil analysis, maybe not this year, but in spring 2023, or so 2024, so we'll see, um, just keep an eye on it, I suppose, that's all we can do. I suppose, maintain um, it, then, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I, I suppose I don't remark, like Edwin, is using a bit of, a small bit of 0730 as well there on, on some ground that needs it. And for some farmers, like I suppose, like really, tree fertilizers would nearly do for most grassland farms. So you go 18612 to get your P out, uh, you're getting the P in the sixth part, uh, you go with your um, protected urea if you're straight nitrogen, so you're getting your nitrogen out that way. And if you need to top up, then mark on some of the other paddocks with uh, K, you have 50% muted potash, uh, which would get out your K on those paddocks then that need an extra bit of K as well. So like ideally, those three fertilizers, they're the cheapest form that you can put together of fertilizers, mm -hmm. and they're the lowest emitting compounds, or sorry, combination that we can come up with well at the same time. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, positive uh, remarks coming in here about the, the work that's happening out on uh, Edwin's farm and, and this Chaga Signpost programme. Just a, 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 some, some more technical questions here, a question around experience uh, that we have of using beans uh, or other protein crops as a break crop to, to bring up the soil fertility. Is there any experience that we have on, on that? Do you want to Deirdre? Yeah, uh, limited enough, um, but having said that, beans and peas and so on, they're legumes. So they, you know, they, I suppose, operate in a similar manner to clover in that they can fix nitrogen. Um, and, and we know from research elsewhere that uh, if, you, if, you, if you have legumes like beans and peas, the residues that are there afterwards increase your soil nitrogen, certainly for the, for the next crop. So... I suppose they fit quite well in a in a tillage type scenario. Mm -hmm. um, probably a little bit more challenging in a grassland system where you're not rotating in with a crop. Uh, but yes, like overall, they do fix nitrogen and they increase the the, the residual nitrogen that's there, or the organic nitrogen that's in the soil that can be released through mineralisation for the subsequent crop. Okay, very good. Uh, Seamus, uh, some questions coming in about the treatment of slurry. There's various different options and products out on the market there. Uh, do any of these products, uh, have you seen any of them that hold ammonia and condition the soil? Or do, do, do we have any yeah. research to, to, to support the, 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 the claims that are being made with some of these products? Yeah, I suppose there, there is research ongoing, Mark, with our colleagues in, in Johnson Castle at the minute, uh, to see can they reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and ammonia emissions. Uh, that's kind of early stage work at the minute. There's also some biological um, additives that some farmers use, and they seem to work that they, they uh, make the slurry a bit more dilute. It's easier to agitate. Definitely from, from some of those ones as well. But there is some work ongoing at the minute, Mark, with our colleagues in Johnson Castle, which will be coming on stream in the next uh, year or, or 24 months. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of the availability of uh, some the, you know, um, protected urea, I know there were some issues mentioned in the last 12 months. What's, what's the situation like there at the moment? Yeah, very much. Uh, look, I suppose as part of the signpost programme, we were very conscious pushing protected urea last year if it wasn't available. Uh, but like, we, we have gone... Uh, we're, we're we're at about 16% at the end of June, Mark, for all our strain nitrogens used as protected urea. We'll probably rattle about 20% this year. 
uh, as well as that, um, between the, the, the ordinary urea, we're at about uh, almost 30% of our straight nitrogens as well used. So because they're protecting our ordinary urea, and at our current rates of, of protected urea, we're nearly 50% of our straight nitrogen is protected urea then at that stage. But the availability, uh, definitely this year, there was fertiliser brought in early in the year, and as the fertiliser was restocked by a lot of the merchants, Mark, there was a lot more protected urea coming in. Mm -hmm. So there was definitely a lot more availability, and we know from farmers they are looking for a lot more now at this stage. Mm. And definitely the question is coming back, Mark, as with protected urea is, mm. uh, it's, it's how long does it, does it last in the bag and the, the dates that, the, that it's actually in the bag at this stage. So farmers are, are, are trusting the signs. They're, they're finding it works very well on farm and they're moving on to the next one now is how far can they actually bring the product um, bef before um, it goes beyond the, the, the shelf life. And I suppose that's the other thing to mention as well, protected urea, Mark. It kind of has six-month uh, kind of shelf life as such. Mm -hmm. So what happens after the six months is the inhibitor on the urea uh, can actually maybe break down and the product just works the very same as urea. So okay. if someone has it over the winter and they're worried whether it's stored or not, just use that product as the first couple of rounds next year. It will work the very same as, as ordinary or worse, mm -hmm. as practical urea is best, and uh, they, will, they will get it to work to grow the grass that they need to grow. But it's, I suppose to get the value is really, I suppose it's important to, to get it spread within that window, really, because otherwise you're, you're I absolutely you're spending back, the yeah, extra yeah, yeah. on the, on the protected and, and, urea. And, 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 the, and the big advantage of protected urea, it, you, you can use it any time throughout the year. So it works the very same as can, and it'll work at the shoulders of the year the very same as urea, but it's lower in ammonia, and it's also lower in greenhouse gas emissions. That's the big, big win, the win-win for farmers. And Ed, Edwin, you were saying to me earlier that you know you haven't noticed any difference really between the protected urea and and your previous uh, fertilizers that you were using. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct, M Mark. I, I honestly can't say that um, I see any reduction in grass growth from changing to protected urea. So, very good. Okay. I, and, and I suppose just just on that, Mark. Um, so Edwin, in fairness, is measuring grass um, and is on pasture base and. We monitor grass growth this year compared to last year, and I suppose using protected urea and reducing his nitrogen has seen no significant um, decrease in grass growing this year compared to 21. Um, it's back about 0.8 of a ton, but we're putting that down to drought, which which I think is fair to say we can assume. And we have a question here: of What about grass growth and fodder production on Edwin's farm? Have grass growth levels maintained within the, with the f change of fertilizer application? I think you've more or less answered that question. I think uh, that 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 is something that you you have uh, you haven't seen the the, the a massive impact on. Um, let me have a look here. So we have just a question in relation to um, advice for farmers, Seamus, regarding fertilizer use for 2023. Um, any 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 general recommendations there? Yeah, great to get the opportunity, Mark. Look, any farmer so is looking in what fertilizer for twenty twenty three. If you're looking for value of money, first of all, you you go with eighteen six twelve to get out your your peas and keys. You go with protected urea to get out your nitrogen, and if you need a little extra K in to top up after that, muriate of potash. Mm. And the beauty is those combinations. And are we are we talking about all farms or dairy specifically? All, all farms mark across the board, and, and like especially heavily stocked farms. Like we're seeing it with a lot of our, our signpost farms. The forty euro Shane mentioned there about changing fertilizer type. We're finding that forty to fifty euro per cow saving across the board on a lot of our more heavily stocked signpost farms. So it's a huge saving. Like on the average on the average farm switching fertilizer type alone is about five thousand euro. And I know, Edwin, when, when we did the calculation with yourself, I suppose, unfortunately, you don't get the 14,000 handed to you in a, in, a, in, a, in a briefcase or anything. But like, when we did the calculation with yourself in the last couple of days, Edwin, you, you would feel that your fertiliser bill didn't go up as much maybe as you thought it was going to go up this year with, with the combination you used, that I'd be fair to say. Definitely, Shane, or, or sorry, uh, d uh, Seamus, definitely. You know, at the start of the year, we were worried about big fertiliser bills coming in. But um, for me, you know, with, the, with the changes we made there, we, we came in pleasantly um under under the target you know so it was it was it was it was great yeah great we have a, a question uh, Deirdre, in relation to the uh, incorporation of clover maybe in a, an existing swarge and as is when is the best time to stitch in clover if you don't want to do a complete reseed and mm. what's the best method to really good question mark the best time to stitch in is in april so as early as you can in the year mm -hmm. um and, it, you know, it, it works very well most of the time. There'll be the odd time it won't work and you might have to go again. And that's OK, a little bit of, a little bit of perseverance or stubbornness, you know. So 
the best way to put it in, if you can, is so, uh, so f to have good conditions. So first, make sure soil fertility is right. Make sure your sward is a uh, good perennial ryegrass sward. So why that's important is if you have an old bushy sward, like an old permanent pasture, your clover seed is tiny. It's like the full stop on a page mark. Mm -hmm. You know, you need mm -hmm. to get the seed to mm -hmm. touch the soil. So uh, good perennial ryegrass, low weed content, good soil fertility, graze off really tight, like down to three and a half centimetres if you can absolutely clean out that paddock and then go in with if you can with some kind of a drill like a nine bock or a gutler or something like that so that you're getting that seed to soil contact mm -hmm. but really importantly then after you've put it in is how you manage the sward afterwards mm -hmm. because you will get the seed to germinate but you know you you do have to do a little bit of work to get it to establish so uh, edwin mentioned earlier you know about looking after that ground for the rest of the year so reduce your 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 chemical nitrogen fertilizer or cut it out if you can for one or two rounds or for the rest of the year if if that suits your system and you have enough grass growing elsewhere uh, so reduce that nitrogen just to give the clover the chance you know to capture the light because i suppose it's important to know that the grass will take up the chemical nitrogen faster than the clover so what will happen is you'll get shading out of the, the clover smothering. yeah and then the other thing is don't leave a heavy cover build up so go back in you know, at around a thousand kilos and graze it out tight. So it's all about getting light down to that little emerging clover plant to help it establish. So I suppose like what Edwin's doing is, is you know, is really good approach in terms of incorporating clover um, by reseeding or over sowing is not doing the whole farm together. Now that's not practical anyway, but you know, if you do big, big proportions of the farm with over sowing, for example, altogether, very difficult to you know push special management on a big area mm -hmm. much easier to do that on a smaller area 10 15 percent of the farm because you do have to do mm -hmm. that little bit of preferential grazing management which is basically you know you skip in and out of the rotation mm -hmm. so you might be going back to that you know every 16 days or so mm -hmm. instead of waiting your 2021 20, so be prepared days. to jump in and out yeah, yeah. and just keeping the cover low uh, will really help that clover. And to the point, Deirdre, when we're talking about reducing chemical nitrogen or cutting it out, it, it's important that we keep putting out the P and the K. Absolutely. On, on the, so it's the whole fertiliser market. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the nitrogen we're cutting, yeah. but we're keeping the P, P and K, K out there all the time. And look, if you have dairy washing super, we, we see uh, clover swords, even established ones, you know, uh, respond really well to, you know, that little bit of boost that comes from, from your dairy washings. Yeah. Do you mind ask Edwin a question there? Because I suppose a lot of grass mixes, Edwin, have maybe a half kilo to a kilo per acre in them uh, I suppose the recommendation would be to go to two kilos of clover per acre like what kind of rates of clover do you incorporate in your scenario um, I just think Shane if we put out a kilo now I, I'd have to check that but um, I don't think we went with a two kilo rate now we just went with a kilo and you got um, a good take even with the kilo I got a great take yeah particularly last year I got a seriously good take yeah um, this year doesn't look quite as good but it's early days yet it's only it's only been great four, maybe four times, you know. It's but you were saying, Edwin, this year that paddock behind us has receded and you set, you noticed that the clover really performed well this year, even in the drought. Yeah, the, the clover certainly this year was a, was such a dry year and it certainly seemed to perf perform better than the the paddocks that had no clover getting nitrogen. You know, the clover the clover paddocks, we call them the clover paddocks, seem to be um, growing much better in a... In a, in a Particularly when the drought got severe, I, I noticed the clover was sort of getting me out of trouble a lot, a lot of the time it came, when it came back to graze them, you know. Excellent point, yes. Um, we have a question here about some farmers being afraid that clover might take over some paddocks. Is this an issue or has have, have, have Deirdre or, or, or uh, Shane or Edwin, have you come across any uh, that that is a, an issue? Not really, realistically, Mark. So uh, Seamus showed in his presentation the, the, I suppose, the growth curve or the contribution to the sward of clover across the year. So, you know, this time of year, you're going to have high clover contents in your sward. So 50, you know, I've heard of even 60% in the last few weeks. But like across the year, you're still only going to have about 20% average. <coughs> For most farmers, the issue will be actually getting and maintaining that 20% average rather than clover taking over and I suppose look a rule of thumb if it looks like there's a hundred percent clover in the paddock it's probably about fifty percent half it yeah 
Remember the clover plant is different, you know, the leaves are more upright, they're bigger, they take up a big area than the grass, the grass grows up more, so you mm -hmm. will see it being more dominant. But, you know, realistically, Mark, it, that's not a major concern. And, you know, um, I suppose uh, one little bit of advice, if there are paddocks that you think have a lot of clover in them right now, maybe graze them a bit later in, so the, in the last Deirdre. rotation. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so you're, you're taking off that cover. And um, getting the light down, and getting the light well. down, yeah. so you're giving the right grass loads of opportunity for tillering. So it's just a little bit of playing around with the management. A lot of clover graze it later in in the last rotation. Okay, thank you very much for that. We're coming to the close of our session now. I just want to say a big thank you to Edwin in particular for uh, an early start this morning. I know you, you had uh, in preparation for this morning's uh, link, uh, but uh, thank you so much for allowing us to onto your farm. And uh, Shane, uh, also thanks for, for, for your help in organising uh, this, this, uh, this interview. Uh, to our panel here in studio, uh, Seamus Carney and Deirdre Hennessy, thank you so much for your your participation. Uh, we're now going to hear how you can be uh, the winner of 250 euros if you tune in. Keep, stay tuned in to us now for a moment. Chagas are delighted to announce the signpost photo competition. Don't delay, capture photos of the action you are taking on your farm to reduce emissions and submit them to the signpost programme to be in with a chance to win 250 euros. Some of the relevant actions include liming, applying P and K to tillage crops, dosing and vaccinating, weighing animals, milk recording, extending the grazing season, checking your board BF farmer feedback report, checking your NMP for lime or K needed, and soil sampling. The closing date is the 14th of November. To apply, go to www.chagas.e backslash signpost. Don't delay. Enter today. Okay, now we're going to go back to County Tipperary where we're joined by Dr. Siobhan Kavanagh who is Communications and Engagement Specialist with the Signpost far Farm uh, uh, team, sorry, programme team. Uh, Siobhan, you have an action-packed week uh, for us uh, next week as part of Sustainability Week. Can you tell us more about what's happening during the week? OK, good morning, Mark. Mark. So the, the team for Signpost Sustainability Week is farming for a better future. And we all know that there is an urgency on the adoption of a lot of the technologies that are available to us right now to reduce our emissions in particular. So the focus for the week is on identifying those simple actions that farmers can take over the next 12 months to help improve in st sustainability on their farm. So the main themes are around reducing greenhouse gases, enhancing biodiversity, improving water quality, and, and so, soil health. So we will have key messages coming out in each of those areas through the week. And what we want farmers to do is to identify a couple of simple actions that they can adopt on their farm over the next short while. In terms of events then, so we have a series of in-person and online events through the week. So our in-person events are four farm walks. There's one in Washford, Limerick, Galway and Offaly. And we would be encouraging farmers to attend those events to see what the signpost farmers are doing to improve the sustainability on their farm across the, those major areas, but also to maintain profitability and output. Um, in terms of the, the online events, there's two events of significance in particular next week. One is the, the launch of the National Farm Survey Sustainability Report, which will happen on Monday afternoon, and there's a webinar on that. And then on Friday, the signpost demonstration farm um, sustainability results will be issued as well. So it's the first year for, for us to issue sustainability results for these farmers, and it's setting out the baseline year for those. So aside from that, then, there's two other things happening. We're launching um, a sustainable fertiliser training programme that's available for rural professionals. And I suppose that is one of our key starting points is to reduce our emissions from nitrogen. So that's a really important course. And that's in conjunction with Ch Chagas Connect Aid and ICOS. And then Declan has just mentioned there the, the photo competition that we're also running next week. Great. And where can people find out more about what's happening next week? 
Okay, well, the, the website, we have a page we dedicated to it on our own Chagas website, and that's at www.chagas.ie forward slash signpost, and there's a specific page in there that all the details for all the events and the activities and the messaging that we'll do throughout the week. And then obviously keep an eye on our social media pages on Chagas Daily, and then the, the local media, we'll have articles and that in the local papers, and also there'll be some local radio interviews as well. So keep an eye on all the channels that we will put out information to, to our clients and to, to the rural, rural professionals also. That's great, Siobhan. Thank you so much. And it sounds like there's something there for everybody next week. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. And that's all we have time for today. My thanks to our speakers and our entire production team. Next week we'll be joined by Professor uh, Frank O'Mara, Director of Chagisk, and Dr. Tom O'Dwyer, who's Head of the Signpost Programme, and they'll be talking about uh, launching the new Signpost Sustainability uh, Reports. So from all the team, we want to say have a good weekend, and thanks for watching. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost Series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagas.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.